I'd like to call this village board meeting to order. This is number 3092. It is March 9th, 2015. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Abernathy. Kim. Here. Meyer. Here. Semple. Sullivan. Here. Voss. Here. Very good. Would everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. We have quite a, a full agenda tonight, lots of different items. And uh, first, we will go to the approval of minutes. Uh, this would be a motion to approve the Joint Committee of the Board of Trustees, Economic Development Commission, and the Planning and Zoning Commission minutes from February 16th, 2015. So moved. Second. Motion by Voss. Second by Kim. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Voss. Yes. Kim. Yes. Meyer. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. Motion carries. Very good. All right. That brings us to the time in the evening when we have public commentary. Would anyone present live wish to uh, come up and address the board at this time? If so, raise your hand. Very good. We have one. Anyone else? Okay, ma'am, go ahead and come on up. And then... Uh, just give us your name and address if you so choose. And um, my name is Ami Lally. I love the Bundle Island Marathon Rock Hill Arena as president. I went 3399 to Valley. Do you want to cut? Okay. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, I think we have you down under presentations in IB. Oh, I'm in the wrong category. Coming right up. <laughs> Coming right Sorry, up. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, very good. I'll close the floor, and that takes us to the presentations and awards. We have five items here this evening. First would be a presentation regarding Gary Wilson. There he is. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Boshe at this time. Thank you. Uh, we're here tonight recognizing Gary Wilson uh, celebrating his 30th anniversary with the village, which, as, as many of you know, Gary is the engineering inspector for us and has worked on a countless number of projects for us. Beyond that, he's, he's been kind of, our, you know, as, as Joe DeVito is in the public works side of, of the house, Gary is our, our go-to guy for, for anything related to the infrastructure in town. Uh, mainly because he's probably built about 90% of the infrastructure in town. So he's been an, an incredible asset to us, very valuable and important piece of our organization. And I just want to call the board's attention to the fact that he's celebrating his 30th year. And uh, Gary is in the audience this evening, so if you could stand up, he's, he's with his wife as well. Gary, thank you for all of your many years of service, and uh, we look forward to seeing you for many more years. Maybe 30 <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take what I can get. I'll take what I can get. Thank you. No, it's been a pleasure. Cool. It's been great working with everyone here, and it's been very rewarding. We've done a lot together, and I appreciate it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a little more for you. <laughs> Come on up. We have a... What is this, a 30-year star award, I guess you could call it. It is a heavy star at that. But uh, it, just, it just says for uh, Village of Mundelein Distinguished Service Award presented to Gary Wilson for 30 years of dedicated service to the Village of Mundelein, March 4th, 2015. That was your 30th, so. That's 30 years ago. Very nice. Star here, right? 
<laughs> I feel like a star <laughs> oh, we'll give them. You can get the box later if you want. We'll be up here. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Well, real good. Thank you. Okay, now that takes us to the part in the evening when we have the item two under presentations and award. This is from the Mundelein American Legion Auxiliary. I came up to test the microphone before. <laughs> I'm sorry, I jumped out of the line there. A little nervous, a little excited. Um, I've already introduced myself, so I won't do that again, but I wanted to um, do a little presentation on a Girl State program this year. Uh, we've been running the ed educational program for the Girl State for 75 years. And, what we do is we select a girl who is just finishing her junior year in high school and we send her down for an educational program. Uh, and it, it runs, uh, the educational program will run her through leadership, uh, her characteristics, her abilities, and uh, it's usually um, a six-day program and a couple of days are traveling back and forth to Eastern Illinois. I also do some public relations with the American Legion Auxiliary and this is one of our Girl State articles that had hit the newspapers. This year we've had to go out into the community um, because we've lost our fundraiser for the program. So we plan to go to various organizations and groups and see what we can do as far as keeping up with this program. I only, not only deal with the high schools here in town, we also deal with um, the um, Lake Bluff Post, uh, who sends girls from Lake Forest, and we deal with the girls, um, the Grays Lake Post, that sends girls to Grays Lake. So we have a variety of girls that go, um, but because we lost our fundraiser for this year, um, the, girl, the ladies have decided to go out into the community and see what we can do as far as collecting donations. Um, the program has um, been run for so long and the girls come back and they're all excited about having been able to go. Uh, it's an educational program. It covers local government. It covers state government as well. They run. They campaign. They make posters. The college is just filled with uh, advertisements of what uh, office they are going to run for. There's a, a very large election process, <coughs> excuse me, and the girls have an installation. They get all dressed up. They're all excited when they come back. It costs us $330, and we usually send um, two students uh, from our unit, but we also send about 13 students from the other posts that we deal with. They finance that. Um, we also cover this in our newsletter. I brought some pictures. Uh, I brought an album that um, I give to the schools when we um, present the program so they know. The, these are pictures of the students and all of the offices that they had run for. And they come back and they have a knowledge much, much higher than when they left. And they're so glad because they have also know that they have a large ability to do more things as a student uh, and as a citizen as well. Um, we also, um, the, the Braze Lake Post also addresses this with the, um, the village. And the village is very good and helps to sponsor students from there and each year we go to their meeting and the girls thank all of the um, board members there as well. We're planning upon going out into the community to different organizations and thank you and um, 
do, do the same request. Um, but this is a phenomenal program. This is one of my favorite programs as far as the, the kids learning more about how to be a good citizen, how that they are capable of running for an office. Uh, and when they go out, some of the girls have been in the lawmaking process because they also learn how to take a thought and process it into a bill and, and then turn it into a law. So um, this is one of the reasons why we have to get out there and explain what we're trying to do as far as education and on the girls. We have a lot, a lot of other programs that we deal with as well uh, in the community and we've been doing it for a number of years. Um, and I won't get into that because we just want to get into uh, this particular thing. So that's what we're, that's what I'm here for today is to explain uh, the program. And I can, I can pass this book around if anybody's interested in looking at it. It gives quite a synopsis of what the girls do and what they are capable of doing when they come back. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Next up, the Human Relations Commission annual update. Mr. Raymer. Good evening. Good to see all of you. I assume you got a copy of the uh, report, so I'll just quick, quick highlights. Uh, one thing I want to highlight, uh, thank you for trusting me uh, to lead the Human Relations Commission. I think one of our big successes so far was the safe and smart community and police forum. In spite of sleety weather, the State of Union and the Blackhawks on TV, we had somewhere between 100 to 120 uh, residents of the village and members of the police department. Chief Gunther and his staff did an outstanding job presenting the goals that he and I agreed on. And uh, they just did a, a marvelous job. And I'm sure you saw it reading the Herald. It turned into not only one, but two front page stories. Followed up the week later, uh, I had staff send out a copy to all of you. It was also the subject of the main editorial, uh, affirming what was done and the lead that our chief and our police department is taking. Uh, other police departments have contacted the village to get information about what we've done. So. I'm very pleased with that. We've already had some preliminary discussion with the high school about turning uh, a student-oriented version of this. The chief is very open to this, and I've talked to administrators uh, unofficially so far at the high school. They're very open to doing something like this on a regular basis for freshmen as they come into the high school. I think it's very important that high school students have a positive and accurate understanding of our police force and how to relate to the police force. Uh, talking to my own daughter, a number of athletes uh, who come over, girls, uh, to my house, I said, what would you think of this? She's a junior. What if this had been done when you were a freshman? And my daughter said, if I'd had that before driver's ed <coughs> and knew, for instance, <coughs> excuse me, the standard procedure on a police stop, I wouldn't be so afraid. Uh, when I'm out there. I would know what's happening. So I think that's uh, a great first step and I want to see that continue. The One World Festival, uh, our second uh, One World Festival, we've already had our first planning meeting for the year, which I am able, uh, because of my job flexibility, to be part of also. We've already made great progress. The, art the entertainment's already lined up and we're looking at a, a more public uh, location for it. So I think the third One World Festival is going to be even better. The Diversity Awards, which took place last month, you were all here. I think we had a great organization and a great individual, part of the great things going in Mundelein that we could affirm. Number four, the Health and Wellness Expo. We've agreed uh, as a commission, it doesn't really line up. Uh, it wasn't well attended. It doesn't line up with our purposes. So we are not going to continue that. I had. Uh, multiple discussions with Margaret Resnick at the Mundelein Park District. She does not want to staff that because it's a Sunday morning during the firemen's breakfast. They already have a health and wellness expo taking place at the rec center. So it's a duplicate 
ugly stepchild, if you will. So that is ending. We're not going to continue it because there's no reason to. Uh, point five, summer concert. Uh, we promote some version of ethnic music. We already have a band booked for August. That's all taken care of. And then lastly, the HRC Book Club uh, continues. Attendance is climbing. Uh, we've improved a bit. Uh, how we get the word out, make sure people know that there are e-books uh, available, listening books as well as reading for people like my wife who commutes to Wisconsin. She can listen to the book. Uh, that wasn't known before. So another step forward. Um, we've got the proposed budget uh, attached. I won't review that. Um, any questions or comments? Yes, Trustee Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, do I call him Commission Chair John. Raymer? Is that what I? You can call me John. That's what my mom called me. Chairman Raymer. Okay. Chairman Raymer. Um, thank you. I had some questions just because, you know, this is uh, pretty new to me. I, and the One World Festival is also pretty new. I mean, it's only been the last two years. Correct. So with this budget here, and um, I see that the increase looks like it's almost double, and I just had some questions about, um, like, some of the costs here. Um, for the one World Festival, I saw that one went up. Is, is it for more tents, or could I ask more specifics on? One of the things we're looking at is a different location where we will have to pay for the location, and it'll be in a much more visible location. Um, the One World Festival was not just funded by the HRC, but a number of community groups uh, gave donations uh, so that we actually, uh, my memory is we finished under cost, uh, so we didn't even use all the budgeted uh, money then, but we're trying to expand it, uh, up the quality of the groups that perform, um, kind of like a car, you get what you pay for. You know, if you pay for a used car, you get a used car. If you pay for a nice new car, you get a better car. So we're looking at upping the quality of the acts. That's the main reason for the increase. Okay. Um, I was wondering if, um, like I know in Schaumburg they have like a festival and like the 15 minute in between so while people are getting ready or something like that, they'll put on martial arts or, or something like that. And I was wondering if we were also reaching out to our local community groups in addition to like we have a Filipino club in town, um, just so that, you know, the organic marketing it does is they'll bring their children, which brings like the entire family and so we'll get like more bodies. Is that something that you've already considered? Uh, there was a lot of outreach to, to, to a lot of groups, and in terms of the, uh, one of the things we did that was new this year, uh, instead of having a dead time gap uh, between the performances, which then people tend to drift away, uh, is we tried it for the first time. We think it worked very well. Uh, we had a, a two-person uh, puppet circus act from Argentina, and that kept people there. We're going to do something different, though, this year. Okay. Um. I saw that um, for some of the police outreach, you were going to go to the Latino churches, but I also wanted to point out that there's that uh, Universidad de Padres mm -hmm. also. Um, I didn't see it mentioned, so I didn't know if you knew, but I mean, Luis is highly involved there. So, mm -hmm. um, And then for the speakers and education, this was just uh, something I was wondering, but if if there are speakers that come to like the high school or um, the library and they have some really good ones, could we like piggyback or do like a handhold thing as opposed to like just silo um, ourselves to like have our speakers and like the library has their speakers? Like, is there any way it could be combined, you know, efforts to bring more crowds to one and build a bond? Well, I think the library, when they and they do a great job, they bring in a lot of different people that are more in the entertainment uh, side of things. And uh, again, this is something like with the police form that has never been done uh, before with the HRC. Uh, so we've already had discussions. Uh, I have put the idea out and we had a very spirited discussion and a very positive one at, at our last uh, meeting to try to put the issue of immigration uh, out on the table, specifically Hispanic immigration, given that Mundelein is 40 percent plus Hispanic. Um, that's the reality of our community. So we just started kicking around uh, the idea, for instance, uh, years ago I saw a film called El Norte, which is the poignant story uh, of a brother and sister who were caught in the Guatemalan Civil War 
and they worked their way north uh, to Los Angeles. I saw it back in the 80s after, after it came out. Uh, we talked about showing that at the high school and then having a board discussion after that with people who have experienced immigration. So our purpose is different than the library uh, in, in entertainment. Uh, that's so I that's mean, an example of what we started discussing, but then we looked at El Norte and said, oh, it's two hours and 40 minutes. That probably won't work. Uh, we'll have to find a shorter movie or something. So that's why we requested this budget. Uh, we don't have anything nailed down yet, but as we're, I continue to try to move us forward to be educational and proactive, we can't come up with a great speaker who can come in in October and go, oh, wait, we have no <coughs> money. We have to wait two years to do it. Uh, we want to do things this coming year. So that doesn't mean we're going to spend all 3000 uh, But if you bring in a quality speaker and you pay any kind of travel expenses, even from Chicago, um, that can be very significant. OK, thank you. Because uh, I mean, it didn't have details, so I'm wondering. Um, one more question I had, which might be more for this way, is I saw that um, you had asked for 1500 for the summer concerts. and. Um, isn't the summer concert budgeted on its own, and so like uh, they wouldn't have to ask for it? Like we, we would have that money supplied for the summer concerts. Uh, in the last year, we split the cost of the uh, uh, band between the uh, HRC and uh, summer concerts, and this year we're doing the same thing. Right. The HRC chose the band. Right. Uh, it's a little more expensive, uh, so the the cross funding worked very well. Yeah. We, we've got a lot of things done already. We already have the group uh, lined up, Bandoleros, which is an outstanding group. Um, they agreed to drop their price down, um, but it's still even more than that, so the village is already uh, contributing. But they're extremely well known. They're recorded. They, we think with the right kind of publicity that we could see a huge crowd uh, downtown for that in August. That's great. All right, thank you so much for mm -hmm. answering my questions. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Trustee Sullivan. Thank you, Pastor Raymer. Um, appreciate all your efforts. Yes. Has the Human Relations Commission uh, discussed or thought about any methods of raising revenue at any other activities? We have not. No? No. You want to sell beer? Uh, <laughs> we don't have a liquor license. <laughs> okay. And well. I think that's outside of the ordinance, which I believe you helped draft. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't recall selling liquor in no okay we'll, we'll leave that right. to well and just uh, okay well, john we could add though that at your at one world festival there is a lot of donations so the seven thousand doesn't really contemplate the revenue that comes in from the one world festival right that comes in the library is a uh is a funder so is the park district park district a number of businesses yeah, a number of businesses 12, 14, 15,000, something like that was, was the cost. Because there's, okay. there's no charge to it. Okay. You know, and it's not just the HRC. There's many organizations that put One World Festival, and again, because of the flexibility of my job, I was actually able to attend the planning meetings, which had never happened before. Um, so I was more involved in it. Thank you. You're welcome. OK. Anyone else? All right. Well, my compliments. I went to the uh, police forum. It was, you know, outstanding. You did a great job, you guys. You did uh, Look forward to the coming year, and we'll certainly take your budget. We have the budget meetings coming up, and, you know, we'll take it certainly under advisement and great consideration. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. This takes us to presentation. We're going to do a little proclamation here, and this is for the this is uh, recognizing the Lake County Center for Independent Living. They are celebrating their 25th year this year. And so before I read this, I was told that there's a number of important people here tonight. And I just want you to raise your hand and maybe wave to the crowd, all right? There we go. Well, let me read your name. Let's see who you are. Just a second here. All right. So Kelly Brooks, Executive Director. There she is right there. Claudia Stevens. Very good. Donna Rasmussen. There she is. Vanessa Gonzalez, excellent. Amanda Mullins, there she is. Chris Holmes, Here. there he is. Laura Mellon, there she is. Judy Honig, very good. All right, well thank you for attending tonight. Let me read this. This is a uh, 
Mayoral Proclamation recognizing Lake County Center for Independent Living, their 25th years of service to the Lake and McHenry counties. Whereas the Center for Independent Living is a not-for-profit 501c3 organization that has served people with disabilities in Lake and McHenry County for 25 years. And whereas the Lake County Office of the Center for Independent Living has been located in the village of Mundelein since 1992. And whereas LCCIL assists youth and adults with disabilities to live independent, active, and fulfilling lives by providing access to educational programs, living skills training, employment readiness, assistive technology training, support groups, peer mentoring, and more. And whereas the Lake County Center for Independent Living is governed and staffed by a majority of people with disabilities who have a first-hand understanding of the disability experience which enables the organization to best serve its patrons. And whereas each year the center serves without charge an average of 2,000 individuals, many of whom live at or below the federal poverty level. And whereas over the years the Mundelein Village staff and the Lake County Center for Independent Living staff have worked together on projects of mutual benefit. And whereas the Mundelein Village Board is proud of its partnership with the Center for Independent Living and pleased to have had the center located in downtown Mundelein for 23 years, now therefore be it proclaimed by the Mayor and Board of Trustees of the Village of Mundelein that the Lake County Center for Independent Living is hereby officially commended for the excellent service it has provided to Lake and McHenry residents and the residents of Mundelein for 25 years, be it further proclaimed that the Village of Mundelein urges the business community civic leaders, elected officials, and general public to generously support the center's 2015 Silver Anniversary Gala Benefit on April 25th, 2015 15 at the Doubletree Hotel. I'm, it's on my calendar, and uh, my wife and I, you know, it's on our calendar to attend that, and I hope that uh, everyone watching certainly considers going to the April 25th Gala at Doubletree. Um, now, to sign up for that, do we go to your website? Is that kind of what we should do there to? We sent you an invitation. Yeah, right. That included the trustees. Um, we know Victor sent an invitation. So if you didn't get one, there's the advertisement on the website. Excellent. OK. So you weren't, didn't have a mic, so let me repeat that. So okay. many people in the community got an invitation. So go ahead and respond to that, RSVP. And then also, if you didn't get one and you want to attend, you can certainly go to the website and there's an advertisement there as well. Okay. I went there the other day and had a great discussion with lots of folks about village issues. It was wonderful. We went pretty deep into the weeds on some details on things in town. It was great. Had a great time. And I'm looking forward to the gala. And uh, congratulations on 25 years of service for us. Thanks so much. All right. Um, okay. Oh, well, I should get this. Yeah, you know what? I have this for you. Come on up. I'm sorry. Well, here it is. It's Kelly Brooks, right? Excellent. Well, there you go. Thank you very much. Let's give him a hand, folks. All right, let's see. Finally, um, we have a proclamation. You can check your packets. This is for the Change Your Clocks, Change Your Batteries Week. Happens twice a year, and I pretty much give the same uh, points every time. A few years ago, there was a fire uh, down by Diamond Lake, a house fire, and I think the people's lives were spared because they had working batteries in their smoke detectors in their home. Real simple thing to do if, you know, once you change the clocks, Focus on your batteries, change those, just check those, because it could save your life. And so we just a great reminder, and we again twice a year we always say that. So there's that. That ends my report. There's no public hearings. Oh, excuse me. No, that ends the presentations and award. Now we go to the mayor's report and then on to the trustee reports. Okay, we're running a little. We have a two trustees out. They were ill this morning. And so we have two missing, but nevertheless, we are going to proceed with a discussion. And this regards the governor's proposed reduction by 50% from the local government distributive fund. And um, we're going to hear some information from Mr. Lebedo, toss out a proposal or two, and then let's go around the horn and 
have a little discussion amongst the trustees and anyone else, okay? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, there you go. There we go. I distributed earlier this evening to everybody a memo uh, that essentially outlines some of the impacts that uh, the proposal from the governor that he's floated out there, the impact that this would have on the village. Uh, we notified the board of this maybe a couple weeks ago, a week ago or so. Uh, for the audience, the impact of the proposal to uh, reduce the <coughs> uh, local uh, government dist uh, distributive fund would be about $1.5 million in lost revenue to the village. And so I tried to quantify this and put this in real terms to the village uh, board on what that would mean. And, and um, uh, I had some help from uh, Mr. Haywood, and uh, I've given some examples of what $1.5 million means to the village. And the first example is that's the equivalent of eliminating the building department, the community development department, and the finance department, or about 16 jobs. Uh, that accounts for about 6% of our general fund operating budget. And uh, certainly um, there are other things that we'd have to do that would be more catastrophic. Uh, as you know, we have an annual uh, vehicle and equipment replacement program that runs uh, roughly about a million dollars a year. Uh, that would probably be uh, first on the radar screen to eliminate something like that. And I think... Um, the board is well aware of the impacts that uh, not keeping up with the replacement of our equipment uh, has on our budget over time. Uh, so then we looked at, uh, well, if we couldn't live without the $1.5 million, what would that cost uh, the average property owner in town uh, to raise $1.5 million in property taxes? So if you take an average home price in town of $200,000 with a home value of $200,000, uh, that would mean that you'd have to increase their property taxes, the village portion of the property tax, 12.5% or about $130 per year uh, for every homeowner with an average home price of, or market value of $200,000. So that's significant. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> I've simply put here one alternative solution. I think it uh, would be nice to say that uh, we think that the state ought to get their house in order and uh, the village should not participate in any way of doing that. Uh, that might be a little unrealistic and short-sighted. So one thought was uh, we've always wrestled with this prevailing wage law. And if we, uh, one suggestion that we came up with is if they could um, modify that act, uh, we know the impact of what the prevailing wage law has on our projects. That increases our cost roughly 20%. So when you look at $10 million that we spent on capital projects this year, uh, that would equate to about $1.5 million in additional costs that we wouldn't otherwise have if that act was not in place. Um, so uh, perhaps it's not a 50% proposal as the governor has suggested reducing the revenue distribution, uh, but maybe it could be 25% um, as a suggestion. So. I just simply put this out there for the board to think about, uh, to, dis to discuss, and uh, I think ultimately we're looking for direction. Uh, we are suggesting that a letter be sent to our legislators uh, from Mayor Lentz that would outline some of the comments that the board makes tonight. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's the information, and we can... Uh, Open it up for some discussion. You want to kick it off? That'd be great. I'll Go turn, ahead, Trustee I'll turn my light on. <laughs> well, this is not a new suggestion. This, is, this has been put forth for three or four legislative sessions. And um, it's never come to pass. However, I take it a little more seriously that uh, the new governor has brought this forward. Um, although... 25% reduction is 
not going to happen. Um, Fifty percent, certainly not. But there may be some graduated type of decrease in these funds distributed to local governments from the state income tax, and that's what everybody has to understand. We're talking about the amount that the state sends us back on a per capita basis of the income tax that they receive, the total income tax. We get so much per population number. Um, and it's been divided by the population on a 10% basis. That is, the state takes 10% of the income tax, distributes it to the municipalities. Now, uh, we may have to deal with some type of reduction, but it's not going to be a one-year uh, substantial reduction, in my view, if it's anything. But I like the idea as Mr. Libredo knows I, I would like, the, the idea of dealing with this prevailing wage law. And everyone should understand at this desk and out there in the audience, whether you're in a seat or whether you're on television, the prevailing wage law is something that states developed in the 1930s during the Depression, an offshoot of the federal Davis-Bacon law, which was meant to set a floor under wages during the Depression so that people made something while they're working for government projects and so that any project of $2,000 or more was subject to prevailing wage. And it's now $3,000 from 1933 to now it hasn't gone up. That's not the main problem. The main problem is now it's not a floor under wages, it's a ceiling. And it costs units of government, of local government, at least 20% more to build roads, sewer plants, libraries, schools, 20% more at least, and some say a lot more, because of prevailing wage. Now, if we didn't have prevailing wage and we were able to decrease the cost 20 percent, I think we would do a lot more work. And a lot more work would result in a lot more income tax. And more income tax and more jobs is exactly what the state of Illinois needs. So I know this governor is on the right track. He's got it figured out. Uh, and I think we have to be patient with him. Uh, it's not going to happen. We're not going to have a brick drop on us in regard to revenue loss. But I think uh, he's got the right idea, and I'm fully supportive of the, of the course he's taken. Okay. Who else? Are we, we can go down. Do you want to go in order? All right. Trustee Kim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so many layers. Um, that's what he said is right, it's great. Um, the Village of Arlington Heights, um, as a board, sent a letter to the governor saying, you know, how much um, that kind of funding cut would hurt them. And they, in unison, said that they wouldn't stand for it. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, you tell me, why we couldn't do a letter like that and then be negotiated down versus telling them we would take a 25% cut or, you know, uh, negotiating up front. You know, I'm just wondering, because this hasn't passed yet. And, um, you know, also, too, to add to what uh, Trustee Sullivan is saying, um, uh, Chairman Lawler of Lake County is also talking to uh, the Rauner team on um, taking out the unfunded mandates. So, I mean, that might help some of this, too. So, I just don't know if I saw the harm in sending a letter saying that, you know, uh, we wouldn't want to put this burden on the residents. You know, this shaking of Springfield is great, and maybe there's some other cuts you could make, but that municipalities were so lean, we could have been like Six Sigma black belts, I mean, through all the years of recession and like carving it down the way it was. And so at the end of the day, I really want to be able to look the resident in the eyes and say, we did everything we possibly could, and this is the end result. 
you know, but that we had fought, you know, for it. Um, I mean, not saying what Sullivan said is not valid, Trustee Sullivan, because like I said, uh, Chairman Lawler is working on that and that could actually, you know, help some of this as well. I just didn't see the harm in, you know, sending a letter as a board, you know, to speak out for it. But. I think the suggestion is that you would authorize me to send a letter at this point, um, uh, you know, in, in the notion would be to send it to our legislators, our representatives, because the negotiating that goes on with the governor is going to be done by the, by the, the House and the, and the Senate. And so we want to influence the people that really are going to be doing the negotiating. You know, we could send a letter to Governor Rauner. I don't know that that's going to have the effect, the full frontal effect, as if we went to our immediate reps. So you're saying we should send it to the reps? Yeah, but why yes, can't we do both? Exactly. Yeah, we could certainly yeah. do both. We could do why? both, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It would be targeted at our legislators, though, certainly. But yeah, we could go to both. Why not? Yeah, it's only paper. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I would like to see us send a letter to the governor as well as our legislators because I think that if <clears throat> he understood the full force of what he's suggesting, <laughs> perhaps he would reconsider. Um, and, you know, when we heard Governor Rauner talk last week, he was big on saying, you know, that things, sh the power should come back more locally so that people will have um, more impact. And that would be great if the state was going to stop collecting money and, s and say, instead, let your municipalities collect it but there's what he's saying is that the state will continue to collect the same amount of money it just won't be shared so instead of the state tightening their budget he's suggesting that we who already have tighten ours I find fault in that logic a bit um, if again if as he's saying let's give the power back locally then great let's let the state stop collecting that money and we can collect it and we know how to spend it better than they do. If that's the logic, I'm all for it. But if they're going to continue to collect that money and keep that money and then put it on us to have to raise taxes to upset our local homeowners, then I don't think that he's gotten it quite right. So I would support us sending a letter to the governor and our legislators and I would support us saying that we are not at all in favor of this reduction. And I would support the letter um, suggesting that if they wanted to truly be helpful, they would get rid of all their unfunded mandates, including prevailing wage. And that would be hugely helpful to help us decide what is best for our community and helping us control our costs better. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Meyer? Yeah, I don't want to duplicate, but I would agree with what Trustee Voss said. But in addition, I don't think I would want to make any of these alternate solutions in that first letter. I think we send it, we object to it. I think down the line, if there is no other recourse and one of these things is going to happen, at that time, that's when you take this out of your pocket and say, okay, if this is an absolute mandate, then we'd like to, you know, have you look at it this way. But at this point, I think we just send a letter that objects to the basic principle of, of you know, everything that we've discussed. Okay. Well, certainly coming off of the recession and the cuts we made, we're, you know, I think the municipalities all over Illinois really are the most, some of the most efficient uh, lean muscle of the delivery of public services really that we have in the whole state of Illinois. It's right here, you know, police, fire, roads, public works. We're running these extremely uh, efficiently and to dig in, it's kind of like going on a crash diet. I've done some of that b before and whenever you do that, you tend to lose muscle mass when you go on a crash diet and the governor's proposing a crash diet on this budget and it's gonna, if it affects us like this, we're digging into some pretty lean muscle to come into us and, and, and expect some cuts in some of the things we do. And we wouldn't have any choice, but probably, as Trustee Voss said, to, you know, to keep services where they're at or 
even near, we'd have to do something with taxes, and that's just not acceptable. I agree. So with this letter, um, I'm hearing that you that you don't want any alternatives presented in the letter. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I agree we can, we can communicate to the governor and to our legislators, and of course they'll have enough paper to paper their ceiling and their wall, and probably their floor. Uh, everybody's gonna say the same thing. Yeah. But suggestions in regard to mandates, a real effective one, the, the suggestion in regard to prevailing wage all of these things will allow us to use our present revenue more effectively. Mm -hmm. And if we have to save some of it, then, then we'll have to. You know, we've all received a memo in regard to our wastewater treatment plant where we got a, a conditional permit from the Illinois EPA with seven different suggestions of the crazy things that, that they want us to do, reducing phosphorus, doing this, doing that. And they haven't figured out what it's going to cost us. They just issue these mandates like they pick them out of a hat somewhere. They don't do all that much except cost a lot of money to local taxpayers. But we have a governor who knows that right now, who's focused on that, who is not being led by the nose by labor organizations in this state. And in fact, just the opposite may be happening very shortly. Well, so yeah, send them a letter, but make those suggestions. Hey, reduce these mandates. How about reducing? Stop this, get an end to this prevailing wage. Now, we have examined the unfunded mandates and how they would affect us. Mm -hmm. And it, it's nothing like the prevailing wage in terms of impact on our budget. I mean, it's, it's some very nuisance items like you suggested. Okay, yeah. but when you want to dial it down to the dollar number, it doesn't have near the impact. Now, when you look at, I think Aaron Lawler put together a list, and the county suffers greatly under the unfunded mandates. Sure. Just all over. It's, we it's all do. very substantial. Um, but in this letter, we can certainly include unfunded mandates if you want. But uh, certainly the prevailing wage, we need to hammer home. The, and it's, I'm hearing that you don't want there any, you know, in no mention of, of, of alternatives in terms of the uh, 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 reductions. Um, can we leave the unfunded mandates out? I mean, uh, focus on the prevailing wage. Are we going to focus prevailing wage? Focus on prevailing wage. I'm good with that. You know, I mean, in my view. We can throw it in, but it's not going to, you know. What, in my view, in, in observing units of government for a number of years, nothing in fosters efficiency like no money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of a sudden we become really good. Yep. at getting along with what we've got. Yep. Uh, not that uh, that's the greatest solution in the world, but if it's the only solution, then it's one that we will do effectively. Yeah, send the letter, tell them, baloney. You know, you raised, uh, the state raised the income tax rate over 60% mm -hmm. a number of years ago, and we didn't get another nickel out of that. No. And they took all that money blew it down rat holes, as far as I'm concerned, because we're in no better shape now than we were before that right. rate went from 3 to 5 percent on income in Illinois. Yeah. And so the more money they got, the more they're going to spend. Okay. And that's kind of true of all of us. Okay. Well, then we'll throw in a mention of mud-funded mandates. Yeah, so I think so. The, I think so. The way the wind is blowing. Very good. Are you okay with that, Trustee Meyer? Okay, very good. Okay, then we'll do that. When, and, uh, when do you anticipate sending the letter? This week. Okay. Yeah, we'll send Thank it you. this week. Very good. That's it for my report. We'll go to the trustee reports. We're going to have some, because uh, we're two, two down here, we'll go to the alternatives here. So Public Works Committee, Trustee Meyer. I actually don't have anything for the report tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Getting confirmation that there's nothing to bring up related to public work, so I'm done. Very good, thank you. Finance Committee Trustee Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This evening we have a motion, and that is to pay uh, an amount to AT&T for a number of bills uh, totaling one uh, thirteen thousand three hundred eighty-four dollars and seventy-five cents. And I'll make that motion to pay these bills. 
second. Motion by Sullivan, second by Kim. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Sullivan? Yes. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Epstein? Voss? Yes. Motion, motion. Uh, Mayor votes yes. Make, make it four. Very good. Uh, this evening on our omnibus list of motions, we have a motion to pay our bill list. Uh, that amount is $1,069,289.63. And some of the significant amounts thereon are, one of them is for $53,695, the purchase of two Florida ex Ford Explorer vehicles. One for public safety, one for public works. We have a bill for Lake Michigan water of $168,992. Piertano Construction Company for the Route 60 water main project. We have a bill of $115,768.80. Is that the final bill for that? No, it's still, still working on that. Okay, and then uh, finally, a large piece of uh, equipment, the Vector. That's a uh, sewer cleaning machine. Uh, vector is a term, evidently the cross between a tractor and a vacuum. I would have to ask the vendor, but I'm assuming oh. that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds good. We'll go with that. Right. It's a wonderful <laughs> machine if you've got a plugged sewer and your basement's full of stuff. Anyway, it's $372,960. And uh, that completes my report. But, Mr. Mayor, I, I had some other comments that uh, I think I've, I've been thinking about for a long time. And it's been brought to a head recently where we've had some controversy lately in regard to the state of our commercial health in the village of Mundelein. Uh, before I talk about that, I'd like to let you know, many of you know, I've been around a long time. This June will be our family's 48th year in Mundelein. I've served on the Planning Commission, I've served on village on school boards. I've been in, in this seat for 16 years, and uh, this is my uh, third to the last meeting. At any rate, I see a lot of concern about the state of the village in regard to its commercial health especially in regard to restaurants, and especially comparing us to the village of Libertyville. I mean, I grew up in Libertyville. I went to Libertyville Fremont High School before there was a Mundelein High School. Still got a, little, a lot of real good friends in Libertyville, and of course a lot of real good ones in, in Mundelein. My wife and I got out of college. We came to Mundelein and we started a business. Mundelein has been awfully good to us, awfully good. So it's with some dismay that I see a few fellow residents become very critical of their home, especially in regard to restaurants. Well, I, this afternoon, I, I went on Libertyville's website, and I thought, boy, they must have a lot of restaurants, and we must not have many at all. I discovered that Libertyville has, on their website at any rate, 87 restaurants. And uh, I think I've been to half of them. Uh, 13 of them I would categorize as fine restaurants. That is a restaurant with a full menu, you know, a three or four course menu and a, a full liquor license. So then I went to Mundelein's list of restaurants. We got more restaurants than Libertyville does. And we have the same number of fine restaurants. In fact, two of them are my favorite restaurants. I think one of the real best kept secrets in Mundelein is some of the fine restaurants that we have here. I don't go to Libertyville to a restaurant. I don't want to drive 15 miles 
I don't want to drive around for 15 minutes looking for a parking place and then walk three blocks to a restaurant and pay 20 to 30 percent more. The $15 glass of wine is not my thing. That's why I live in Mundelein. So it confuses me when I hear that we don't have any restaurants. I, I just, I don't understand it. These are facts. You know, negatives are to be expected. That's human nature. You know, consider the guy who killed the golden goose. We're not about to do that here. But at the same time, consider Mundelein's positives in comparison to the town that you are so envious of, little small number of you. Industrial base, far, far bigger in Mundelein than in Libertyville. Municipal facilities and services, in my view, substantially superior. I'm talking about police, fire, and public works. Golf courses. One of my favorite things. <laughs> Libertyville's got a little nine hole course that the kids play on. One of line has five 18 hole golf courses. Two of them, championship courses, ranked the highest in the, in the Midwest. Parks. One line has twice the acreage. Libertyville does in its parks. We've got a thriving health center. We've got a water park. We've got a kid's sprinkler park. Our recreational facilities are far superior. Our library. Libertyville just spent Seven million dollars to add 10,000 square feet to their library. And they still can't handle, hold a candle to our library. The work at our library tell us people from Libertyville come over here. And we welcome them. That's fine. Schools. I know we have good schools. I spent a morning in District 77, Fairhaven School in Mundelein. I do it every year. It's a great school with a great staff. So too, our District 75 and our District 79 and our high school. Anybody sitting out there or looking at this on television thinks we don't have one of the best high schools in Lake County needs to go there. Unfortunately, they don't give us the average ACT score of the top 20 students. Sure, our demographics mean that we've got some kids that need some help. And of course, they enter into the average. Don't think for one minute that the students at Mundelein High School don't have every educational opportunity that the kids in Libertyville or any place else have. And I can tell you that with every bit of confidence that I can, I, can give, I can give you. Beautiful places. Lots of beautiful places in Libertyville. Not so much in Vernon Hills. But you can combine all of them in Libertyville and they don't hold a candle to the beautiful spot that's St. Mary the Lake Seminary. Or lots of other spots in Libertyville. So I, I say this because I'm a little frustrated I'm a little bothered by people who are so negative. So let's get together. Let's not forget our strengths. As we work to make Mundelein an even better place to own a home and raise a family and work. And I thank you very much. A motion regarding the well, here, I'll just read. Motion to approve, no, no, no. Motion to pass an ordinance establishing the administrative procedure for the village of Mundelein to determine eligibility under the Public Safety Employee Benefits Act. 
I'll make the motion and then we can explain it, I guess. Okay. Second. Motion by Trustee Voss, second by Trustee Kim. Discussion? Well, this is to change and allow uh, for the first round of decision making about eligibility um, under the Public Safety Employee Benefits Act to be done by the administrator so that if it was a clear cut case and we didn't have to have a, an attorney at the first round, it would save everybody money and time, correct? That's the way I read it. <clears throat> well, I will take a shot at explaining this. It's complicated. I've also asked Lynn Maley, our HR uh, specialist, to uh, be here tonight so to keep me out of trouble. And uh, I know that we worked on this um, with our police chief and fire chief uh, to make sure that this was something that we thought would be good for uh, us to move forward with. There are, when you talk about uh, disability, um, uh, for, uh, uh, a full-time employee disability, in the police and fire. That's all we're talking about. Yep. Yeah, could I just interrupt? Because mm -hmm. I think we all get sort of the basic of what this is. We already have this. This isn't a new correct policy. All we're talking about is making so that there's an administrative. Yeah, there's an administrative one hearing level. process uh, to uh, make a determination on whether or not the qualifying event is considered uh, catastrophic. And when uh, a public safety uh, is uh, injured in the line of duty and it's catastrophic, uh, then they're entitled to certain benefits. And so we're only talking about the procedures for making that determination. Right. And so that procedure we're suggesting by ordinance would be a hearing officer uh, procedure in which uh, we would uh, employ or appoint, I guess, a uh, person, an, an attorney, uh, that is has experience in labor law uh, to make that determination um, based on the act. Uh, right now, we do not have the hearing officer. Uh, one of the benefits of doing that is that we think <clears throat> it will also, uh, in the long run, if you end up in one of these, they can get very costly. And um, but any appeal that goes forward is done on the record uh, that was created uh, through the hearing officer process. So we think that that's a more equitable way for mo both the employer, uh, the Village of Munline, and the employee uh, by having a third party make that determination. Uh, and they can always appeal it to yes, a court of law. Correct. Okay. So that's essentially what uh, approving this ordinance will do is establish that hearing officer process. Mm -hmm. okay. but, doesn't, but doesn't the hearing officer process only take place in a more complicated case? Correct. Because if it were a simple case, you could make that determination at a local level Correct. without it going to a hearing officer. <clears throat> right. Whereas we, if it were more complicated, then it might need to go to a hearing officer. Yes, that's uh, correct. Uh, in the case where it's clear cut, uh, obvious, uh, in line, uh, uh, in the line of duty, uh, catastrophic injury, and we've been fortunate, uh, knock on wood, to uh, very few and far between. But in those instances, uh, the village administrator would make that determination that it qualifies, and they'd be entitled to the full benefits of the act. Um, in those instances where it's not so clear cut, and those are more commonplace, uh, there is this third party uh, that would make that determination. Okay. Anyone else? <coughs> okay. Great. Clerk, please call the roll. Voss? Yes. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Motion carries. that we should know? I actually do not have anything this evening. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Chief? Same thing for fire, ma'am, quiet. Good, we like quiet. Quiet is all good. All right, well then, that's all, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Thank you very much. Well, coming back to you, Trustee <laughs> Voss, Community and Economic Development Committee. We have a few things there that 
should promote a little discussion. We do have a few things here that are going to promote a little discussion. Before we get to them, I just would like to announce that uh, the GLMV, GLMV Relay for Life will be held uh, June 27th in Vernon Hills this year. We've hosted it for several years, and it's only fair. And um, the first Relay for Life GLMV uh, fundraiser will be this Saturday at HITS from 4 to 10, and HITS is donating a portion of their proceeds uh, to the GLMV event. We're still looking for uh, any other business sponsors and participants. You can give me a call if you're interested. Moving on, uh, the first thing that we have is this sign code. So, can we discuss it without a motion, Charlie, or do I have to make the motion first? You should make the motion first and get a second. Okay. Then we can amend it if we need to. So I'll make a motion to authorize staff to draft an ordinance adopting a new sign code for the Village of Mundelein with the proposed revisions. Second. Motion by Voss, second by Trustee Kim. Discussion? Well, I'd just like to point out a few things about it, um, if I can. The first thing is that we have been working on this sign code revision for a few years now, and um, we, in terms of, it seems like whenever we do anything, we always hear from people, I didn't know you guys were talking about that. So let me just stop right there and say, in the few years we've been working on this, we've had five Committee of the Whole meetings, three public presentations, an online survey, it's been in our quarterly newsletter, it's been in our e-newsletter seven times. Uh, it, we've had two direct mail flyers that were sent, um, <coughs> direct emails. Um, it was announced and discussed at the Mundelein Business Alliance, and we have announced it several times at the Village Board meetings. So, with that said, there were a few um, items that last time it was before us were sort of um, decision items and we had asked it to go back to the public before it came back to us and I was just wondering if, um, Victor or Amanda, if you guys could just speak to some of those public policy issues that we had talked about. Uh, sure, we can. Um, I know that I have certainly put a fair amount of hours into this sign called read write, but I will admit I have not put in the amount of hours that Amanda has put in to getting this document to the point that it is here. I know that she's put in a lot of hours with uh, a lot of help um, from our consultants. Uh, Camilo's Arista is here to answer any questions. Um, Amanda knows the document a, a lot, a lot better than I do. Uh, I know it, but I know it enough to be dangerous and to misspeak or misrepresent. So I will hand it over to Amanda to answer. Uh, your questions and talk about the policy questions that were raised at, at a committee meeting here a couple of months ago. Thank you. Yeah, so um, there were about, there were three policy questions that you asked us to take to the local businesses and the um, sign consultants, and so I will go through those uh, quickly. Uh, one is whether the uh, sign code should limit the number of items of information on a sign to four or six items. Um, you know, an item on a sign could be anything from the name of the business to um, the slogan of the business, a uh, logo, et cetera. And so definitely a uh, majority of the people wanted to see uh, more items of information on the sign. So uh, about the people that attended that particular meeting, there was one person that said four items was sufficient and then 11 people said that they would like to see six items. Uh, there was some conversation at that same meeting where they discussed that they would rather see no restrictions at all, but it's very common to see restrictions um, on items of information on signs. Uh, the next was whether to allow neon and LED around windows. This has kind of been a trend. Uh, it's very popular in the city. Uh, it's something that we've seen start to pop up around the village. And uh, one respondent said yes. 
uh, seven said no, and three were unsure, uh, but the majority said that no, they would not like to see that. Uh, we didn't take formal polls at uh, other meetings, but the, at the other meetings, there was still some commentary that people did not want to see the LED around the windows. Well, could you just announce the third one, then we'll yeah. come back to the top. That'd be great. Uh, the other was whether to change the window sign coverage, and that was from, uh, we, we currently allow 50%, and that's wh whether to reduce it to 30%. Uh, it was, a majority wanted the 50%, so it was eight, eight people at that meeting wanted to see 52, wanted to see 30, and then uh, there were two that said neither, they wanted to see a visual comparison. Um, you know, it's, it's very hard to, everybody has different window signs, so it, it's hard to really justify like a, a comparison without going through like a ton of pictures, but we could definitely do that. I have a large inventory of pictures of signs. Right, got that, okay. Right. Yeah, so let's just understand. So in this document that we have now, is it at four or six items? Six. It's at yes. six, okay. On the neon and LED surrounding the windows. It's prohibited. It's prohibited. Correct, it's prohibited. We are not allowing the neon or LED around the windows. So you're talking about the outline. Just the outline of win like windows and doors. Uh, you could have a neon or LED sign in your window. In the window, right. Yes. And just to clarify, Mr. Mayor, yes. this doesn't include holiday decorations. Right, correct. It does not include holiday decorations. Very good. And then we kept it at 50. Yes, correct. We kept it at 50%. Cover. Okay. And that was easy, or it's easier as well from an administrative standpoint. It's easier to kind of visually say that's 50 than to try to calculate a 30%. Right. Very good. Um, just on these three things specifically, I had a question on the neon LED. Um, the last time it had come before us, it was a no LED, but neon is okay. So with the new revisions, neither like both would be prohibited at the previous meeting it was both were being recommended as being prohibited okay so did anyone come to the meetings that had neon or led around their window yes okay uh, we did have some representatives there and they were just like uh they were probably in the yes they, vote okay they were probably <laughs> the yes votes i i actually don't know who the yes votes were because just a quick count yeah so. okay i just wanted to make sure that somebody who actually did have you know the window outlines did did come yes thank you okay any other oh trustee meyer yes yeah thank you um i att attended the last public meeting on the that you had here with the sign code and it was generally well received and and there was a lot of favor to the changes that had been made all along um, incorporating their viewpoints and feelings so from the meeting standpoint um, they were basically well pleased with the progress the sign code had made <clears throat> my only comment on it um, is that while we do have a fair amount of pole signs that need some help in Mondelein I still object to them unilaterally being banned because there are some very attractive pole signs. And, and granted, I know people are looking at the ones, a lot of them that we have, that um, may need some help. But because of that, I, don't, I just don't think that we should be banning them completely because there really, really are a lot of very attractive pole signs. So that's my only... Um, bone to pick with the current sign code. Okay. Yes. General questions now about the sign code. Okay. Sure. Um, yes. I just wanted to make sure. Last time it had come before us, I thought the majority voted by attrition, but this one is by amortization. Is this correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. The proposal is for amortization. Five years. Um, everyone asks. So I will ask so I know what to say. What about Bill's Pub sign? That is a pole sign with a letter board. Um, will that have to come down? Yes. Okay. That is subject to the amortization if the board chooses to go through with that. Did anyone from Bill's Pub come to talk about that sign? No, not that I'm aware okay. of. Uh, they did not sign in if they were present. Okay. Um, 
just don't want them to do the, oh, we didn't hear about it until just now. They yeah. def they received the mailings, though. Yeah, I so. mean, for sure. Trustee yeah. Voss went through everything. And, like, you know, that that's the thing. It's like somebody will always, no matter how much you do, be like, I never heard this. You know, this is all news to me. <coughs> and, like, no matter how far and wide you put it out there. Um, and so, I mean, it, it's good. We have seriously blasted it for years out there. And that was my concern was that, you know, will they have enough opportunity to speak? And they certainly did. Um, all right, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. It reminded me of something else that was one of the discussion points on the fees for the companies that are going to be required to replace their signs. I know that there was some discussion um, at that public meeting about fees and potentially waiving fees and, and the cost of some of that doing that. Have we come to any conclusion on any of that at this point? We have a grant. There, yeah, there is nothing that... Uh, was discussed at a staff level yet about fee reductions. We did discuss very preliminary with building about changing some of the fee structure um, in general um, for permits, but nothing is being proposed for, for change at this point, but that doesn't mean it couldn't in the future. Uh, the fees aren't actually addressed in the code itself. Right. And I, so I if that's something that the board wants us to look into, we will we could definitely do that um, but there is the grant program in place that people can apply to get some relief with replacement of signage um, so that's always a possibility and we have that that that's a, a quick readily available thing in terms of the fees that's something that we'd have to take a closer look at right and that was one of the only things that really came out of that last meeting was a discussion on on fees and some concern in that area and it isn't addressed here so I, I I think I know I for one would like to see that addressed going forward um, to come to some kind of plan in addition to you know the grant and that because not everybody's going to apply for that not everybody's going to get right. accepted for that and, and so there are there could be a whole host of people that aren't able to take advantage of that and would like some kind of relief. Sure, and, and to put it in perspective, in the report we did, staff did an inventory of the signs in the village um, and uh, of the commercial signage, there were approximately 876 signs and 214 of them were non-conforming. In some way, either it was a pole or, or a cabinet sign. Um, looking at that perspective, I didn't look at landscaping and look at setbacks. Um, in terms of uh, industrial, there were 162 signs and 27 were non-conforming. Uh, Percentage-wise, you know, it was about 22% of signs. So it, it signs vary in price. It depends on what somebody wants to put up. So it could be, you know, an inexpensive venture. It could be a more expensive venture. I know that I did discuss a little bit with one of our local sign contractors um, some ways that he could even. Uh, he was asking about modifications to cabinets to kind of make them into what what we're looking for under the new code. And there are some creative ways to reuse some of those structures, but uh, meet kind of those goals of the new code as well. Okay. Yes, Trustee Voss. Thank you. So um, my question is about, you know, my fave electronic signs. Yes. So I, and I know that I marked this, and I, of course, can't find where I marked it in my little computers having some major problems this evening. So um, currently we require a 15 foot setback. Yes. And that will remain? The proposal is to reduce it to, to five feet. And why do we want them within five feet of the curb? Because really that would be like smack dab on the sidewalk, right? We have granted some variances in the past for setbacks. St. Um, Andrews is one of them and uh, Consumers Credit Union's another one of those. Um, the, it would be closer to the sidewalk, but there's still typically the parkway that comes in between and the sidewalk and then the five feet for the signage. Um, the reason for the proposal is that a lot of people are asking if they want to retrofit their signs that they already have in place with a cabinet, and many of those signs are closer than the 15 feet. It's a board policy decision. If you do, do not want that, you want us to change it back, we can definitely do that. Could you, uh, you said many people that are thinking about retrofitting are yes. closer. Yes. 
But they they don't have electronic signs. They don't, but they have their signs that are in, already in existence. Um, typically, that's where the electrical is already coming through, and so putting in an already ex expensive sign and then having to either relocate electrical and relocate foundations, sometimes it's easier for them to do it in the place that it already is. And Can you give me a for instance? Because I'm really having a hard time thinking of an electrical sign. Well, the two, uh, I, the consumer's one and the St. Andrew's signs are the, the closest for example, that I can that I have off top. So, of and even though that they already have a variance, they'd have to either get another variance or move their sign. Yes. Are there other signs? There are a lot of signs in town that are likely to be close five feet or closer. Um, that's because we don't have a setback requirement currently. Well, I was just thinking that for those particular signs, we require a big frontage and a big parcel of land. We do, correct. Um, so are there other locations that are more likely to then get one of these because they only require a five-foot setback? I think an example might be um, Tavern on 60 sign. Like that sign is likely one of those close signs to the property line. And so if they were to ask for a sign, it, they'd either have to move it into their parking lot, or further into their parking lot, or ask for a variance. Um, but that, that's an example I could think of for a sign like that. We, are we talking about two different things, yeah, electric yeah. signs and electronic yeah, yeah. signs? She was electric message signs. No, I'm talking about electronic message signs. No, they don't if, have two and a half acres, though. They don't have two acres. And I'm just using it as an example, oh, yeah. not necessarily that right. that's uh, one that's asking for it. But. Okay, so I'm asking specifically because of the size of lot and the frontage that we require, how many electronic message signs? I, d I don't know. We, we looked at that when yeah, that the board, not this board, but the past board, uh, considered that ordinance, and there wasn't that many. I mean, uh, the number to me is, seems to me it was around 15 properties in town that might meet the requirements that we had for electronic message signs. Right. And But the five-foot setback distance from the property line really doesn't come into play. It could be 10 feet, it could be 15 feet, as Amanda points out. Um, that distance doesn't, I mean, it matters, but I think the reason that we've selected this distance is to, uh, to not adversely impact others that may want to redo their signs. If somebody has a sign at, uh, on their property that's seven feet off their property line, and now we say it has to be 15. If they came in to change that sign, we'd say you, you have to move your foundation, move your electrical, and rebuild your sign 15 feet away instead of seven feet away. So when we looked at the signs in town, mm -hmm. uh, we determined that five foot setbacks seemed reasonable because there were lots of signs that were up near the property line. Correct. Uh, and it didn't seem to have a real visual impact or problem uh, for them to continue to have the sign there as long as they complied with the rules that we're proposing in the new sign code well so but I mean I guess I'm just worried that I wonder if somewhere else at one of these other locations that you talked about that it could be visually impairing to only have a five-foot setback and actually I'm wondering like the one at St. Andrews yeah, that one's got to be pretty close. That if one that's, is close. you know, I wonder if as your if that has any impact on vision as you're turning. Probably not because it's on the I'm right hand side. I'm not aware of side. anybody calling complaining that. No, there's a that one doesn't. Um, you know, some of the properties I can think of off the top of my head that would likely qualify for an electronic sign would be probably the Loaded Buffalo business. They would qualify. Mm -hmm. um, Santa Maria, the, uh, you know, for the church portion. I know they already have the the school sign, but the church would 
you know, might likely probably be interested in a sign. I, I think ABC roofing mm -hmm. on Route 45 would qualify. Okay, so that helps me because those locations, five feet, as much as I don't like these signs, five feet wouldn't ha visually impair anything, which is really all I was trying okay. to figure out. Yeah, so th those are the types of businesses that meet the those frontage and acreage requirements. Okay, well then I guess I'm okay with that. As and much as I would like to take them out all together, I'm okay with that. And we would still require the, the setback, the 50 foot from the uh, residential. Right, So. and the nits or the... Yes, and we still have the time period requirement. 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Trustee Sullivan. I saw my light on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we talked, someone mentioned this, uh, uh, two methods of dealing with signs that are illegal, the, the attrition method uh, the, and the amortization method. And, it, and I guess I had this definition explained to me, but tell me if I'm interpreting this right. Attrition means a sign that needs to be replaced because it's old, knocked down, wear it worn out. Correct. Or Whereas an amortization big. just sets a time limit by which a non-conforming sign must be replaced. Yes. And that time limit is five years? No? Correct. Well, you young people think five years is a long time. But really, it's not. No, it's not. And in five years, you're going to have every, almost every poll, I would say every poll sign that's here now will be here in five years. And you're going to go out, serve notice, it's got to come down. And w the mechanism of that will be uh, serving a notice and then right. a you citation uh, or a letter, uh, a notice of citation that's imminent, and then, then a notice of citation, and then? We, you would go through def a notice, mm -hmm. and then likely you'd have to do some sort of citation. Um, we did co uh, consult legal on this, um, our special counsel, Kelly Cahill, about the time period, and we threw out a number of, it was five, seven, 10, and she said that five is, is very, very you know, normal of a time period, and you wanna make sure that you give enough of a time period that, um, that if the sign depreciates over that time, that it's, it's an acceptable amount of depreciation, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I would say that if, if this is gonna be uh, acceptable, the board that in just the next few months you would want to make the owners of a pole sign or any other sign that is subject to this amortization schedule sure notified right that on a certain date they gotta have a new sign and we we talked to council about this and for instance in McHenry they issued letters to these owners of the property then um, if they actually don't comply, they came up with a system of um, kind of a fee to keep it up over time. But okay. this was after the time period ended and they decided to extend it further. Well, the variance process so. is one that could be entered into, evidently, in order to get approval or an extension of the It time. could, but you ha I mean, I would caution mm. against granting too many variants because what makes someone one person sign you know, better than somebody else's in terms of granting a variance. If you're going to grant the variance, then perhaps you either extend or you get rid of that stipulation altogether. Well, there's, uh, we have to do everything up front and at an early time because uh, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth will be something that will take up a lot of your time. And sure. it won't, you know, it won't be fun. And this matter has not been been a, any secret whatsoever. You know, we've been we've been very very open with those that have attended our public meetings. Um, in all our meetings, we have been quite candid and said that there have been this this, this this there has been the discussion of amortization, and that staff was bringing this document forward with the recommendation of amortization and this five year period. So um, again, we fully have to, we have fully disclosed that. Um. So again, we have a grant program that we can make sure is fully funded so that we can help with, sorry, 
this is so funny to me because you and I are not going to be here for this when this goes through. So we can make all the suggestions we want, but we won't have to hear the complaining either, um, which strikes me as very humorous since I've been hearing it for 12 years. So um, there is a grant program in place, and we will write that when we tell them your sign will no longer be in compliance in five years, but you can apply for a grant that we will help you with up to 50%, up to X amount of dollars, in the hopes that we are helping these business owners to change their signs and get up to date. That was what the That's correct. And Amanda and I have had a number of conversations about what are the steps and what are we going to do after the adoption of the code? How are we going to let the business community know that there has been this change? You know, and everything leading up to that five-year period of time, you know, we've talked about putting articles in the newsletter and the uh, e-blast, um, certainly doing a better job of marketing the sign program. Um, I know that for the next um, budget year, I have asked for more money. Um, for this grant program, I've you know asked for tw I'm asking for twenty five thousand um, dollars towards it. So you know those are a series of things that we have come up with um, to kind of help matters out. You know at our meeting we have also disclosed that aside from just being um, government and just being maybe in part a little bit heavy handed with this five year amortization, <coughs> we we thought that we were coming with. We were also going to be resourceful in providing the businesses with the tools, such as the grant program, to say, here, yes, we have made this change. This change does impact about, what is it, 25% of the businesses uh, in our community. But, you know, there are tools, and there is this grant program that helps matters out uh, a little bit and kind of softens the, softens the blow. So um, we have had a series of discussions, and I think we will continue to have discussions about um, what are the next steps. Will that grant program be for the entire village, or is it still a selected area? No, the grant program as it is written today is extended is um, for the entire community, and will remain for the, being for the entire community. I hope that perhaps it would be, uh, I hope that you will reach out to the Mundelein Business Alliance as a way to contact businesses. The Mundelein ha Business Alliance has been very supportive of, of what we've been doing. They've been instrumental in helping us get the word out about the, some of the proposed changes and just uh, spreading that word, and we will continue to work with them. My understanding is that the business community is, ex is excited about this sign ordinance and feels like it'll put a better face on our village and help with economic development. The business community is excited. Um, so are a number of contractors that we have spoken with. There are a number of positive things, a number of things that are in this document that you couldn't do um, with, the, with the ordinance that we have in place today. So um, there are many steps forward from what we have. Is it a perfect document? Absolutely. But I think it covers a number of areas um, that the business community has been speak, um, speaking for and desiring to, to get some more flexibility, uh, flexibility in, in terms of signage. Right, and I think if you look at the um, attachments to the packet, mm -hmm. there is an attachment that shows examples of images of existing, what in the existing being, the existing code versus the proposed code. And you can see just with all the X's over what the existing code allows versus mm -hmm. what today's code allows, it definitely opens up a lot of opportunities for businesses to do advertisement. It also opens up opportunities for our organizations in town to do things by code. So it, it will remove a lot of kind of anxiety that we get from businesses just wanting to do what you would think is a normal everyday sign and our code didn't allow for that, so. And the other thing is that we are gonna prohibit some existing signs. Some of the, you know, I would just remind the board that we have been having staff sort of turn their back on non-conforming signs, not enforcing our sign code, knowing that it would change. But we all agreed that once we make this change to the new sign code, we'll support staff in their efforts to enforce the sign code immediately. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I just, anyone else? Okay. My comments are, uh, I just want to compliment staff. You know, it's been the two years where it's been going on a steady stream, but I'm just, my memory goes back to the beginning when we had our first meeting on this. And if you remember the first committee of the whole, we kind of stumbled out of the gate with that first meeting, but we came together the next one. Mm -hmm. And with our consultant there and with staff there, and 
we kind of came together and, and determined to be bold about this and respond to the desire in the community to see some change and to see it fairly quickly. Um, and uh, uh, I know we didn't all get everything we wanted in this, but uh, I think we've had a, obviously a tremendous amount of dialogue, and it's 174 pages, by the way, of clear definitions. I've, you know, in reading through it, it seems like it's written in pretty clear English so that any business owner can read it and understand what the requirements are. I think it's outstanding. Um, so my compliments to staff and to the board, and um, it's really an announcement, I think, to our community and to others. I mean, we, it really is, in my mind, a, a bold document and that tells everyone that we are aesthetically, um, uh, you know, aggressive here. We want to make a statement with our sign code that um, it's going to be very business friendly. In fact, there's more types of signs allowed. I'm not mistaken mm -hmm. when you get through it. It's not That's restrictive. Correct. It comes, it expands and brings in other types of signs that the current one doesn't address. So um, I think it's outstanding. We ready to take the roll? Mm -hmm. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Boss? Yes. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Very good. And if I had to vote, I would vote in the affirmative as well. Okay. I think that was yes, okay. Okay. text amendment to title 20 the next um, as we've talked about I think at the last board meeting maybe a couple of board meetings this is a motion I'll make the motion to pass an ordinance amending certain sections of the municipal code relating to the zoning ordinance title 20 regarding parking space dimensions impervious surface coverage <coughs> open fences community centers and recycling facilities. Motion by Voss. Second. Second by Kim. Discussion. Clerk, please call the roll. Voss. Yes. Kim. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. Meyer. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, next up we have, um, uh, this is for a variance for 1291 Casing Lane. Are the petitioners here? Okay just in case anyone has any questions. Um, this is regarding a gazebo size. So I'll make a motion to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission minutes and findings of fact. Motion by Voss. Second. Second, Second by Sullivan. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Voss. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. Meyer. Yes. Kim. Yes. Motion carries. Um, motion to accept the Planning and Zoning Commissioner's recommendations. Second. Motion by Voss, second by Meyer. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Voss. Yes. Meyer. Yes. Kim. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. Motion carries. Um, and lastly, I'll make a motion to authorize staff to draft an ordinance granting a variation to section 20.52.0 zero four zero parentheses h parentheses one granting relief from the maximum square footage permitted for a gazebo at 1291 casing lane motion second. by Voss second. second by Meyer discussion yes please Trustee Voss um, I just want to say that I don't normally grant variances but in this case I think that there's a compelling reason, given the uh, size of your lot and where your lot is, of why this uh, variance should be granted. And I will support it, though you might no, have to call 911 for Mr. Sullivan. You're just getting soft. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Trustee Sullivan. Second. Yeah. That's made and seconded. Oh, no, no, no. We're, no. I thought you wanted to say. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. It looks like it a beautiful It was made thing. and seconded already, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. Do you have anything? No, it looks beautiful. I'm envious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Clerk, please call the roll. Voss? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Kim? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I'm hoping I'm done because otherwise you're going to have to give me a second. Um, let's see. That's it. I am done. That's wow. all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Next up, Communication and Marketing Committee, Trustee Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have no motions tonight, but I have a couple of updates. Um, last weekend, this was actually about yours, but uh, the Mayor's Math Challenge was last weekend. Um, more than 185 students, which was double the number of participants from last year came. And so we had two feature articles in the Herald and the Pioneer Press. Um, a nice bump for marketing there. Um, I just wanted to shout out to some of the sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> we had uh, $8,000 in scholarship money raised from these eight sponsors, Garden Fresh, uh, McDonald's, McLean Fogg, Fifth Third Bank, Consumers Co-op Association, uh, Mundelein Community Bank, Northside Bank, and Steve's Window Cleaning. That's not you, right? No. All right. <laughs> um, also, uh, last weekend was Coffee with the Mayor. Yep. Want to talk a little about how that went? Yeah, Coffee with the Mayor was at Omega, at the side room. We have that every at the first Saturday every month. And um, uh, it's myself and Trustee Abernathy joined me for this one. And there were about a dozen people for about an hour and a half, I'd say. And we just talked village issues over a cup of coffee. It was great. And uh, went over a wide variety of, of things and got into great detail. And it was very well-spirited and very nice. Um, do you know when the next one is and who it's with? I don't have the trustee yet. Um, okay. It's the first Saturday of April, and so it'll be at Omega again in the side room when you walk in okay. on the right side. I'd look at the date if I had it, but we can secure April 4th. Huh? April, 4th. April 4th. April 4th, okay, April 4th. And um, there's a new business profile video up, and that one's for Tighthead Brewery. And it's yes. a, is it up on YouTube right now? No. Okay. No. No. So <laughs> what does this mean then here? Uh, maybe it's being edited. It says business profile video. We filmed it this last week. Oh, okay. Over and it's, a tight head brewery company. So it's being edited? Yes. All right, I'm getting a nod so yes from the back of the room. Yes. It went, 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 went very well. Yes. Yep. All right. And lastly, I have um, that we are finishing up the quarterly newsletter, and that's going to be distributed at the end of March. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Trustee Abernathy isn't present, so that takes us to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Trustee Sullivan, how can you spend more of our money there? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have one motion. Uh, re uh, this is in regard to a request for authorization to advertise for construction bids for the fiscal year ending 2016 street project. Yep. Um, this is just part two? Yes, okay. Everybody, I think you have seen the, the information regarding the, um, the part one and two of the street project. We're going to separate this into two bids and uh, hopefully do everything. But if not, uh, I think the, the split of the bidding process will help us make a decision in regard to how much we actually can do. So this is a motion to authorize the public, the Department of Public Works and Engineering to solicit bids for the fiscal year 2016 street improvement project part two. I'll make that motion. Second. Motion by Sullivan, second by Trustee Kim. Discussion? All right, clerk, please call the roll. Sullivan? Yes. Kim? Yes. Foss? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, <laughs> they're very good. That takes us to other reports. Does any trustee have any other report or comment yes. or issue? Yes, trustee Yes, Meyer. I do. Um, I'd like to announce that the Old Village Hall Study Report Committee will be presenting, um, the committee will be here at the next Village Board meeting and they will be presenting in a PowerPoint presentation um, a synopsis of the report and the full report will also be available um, as part of our package for that next meeting. Excellent. And uh, that's been in the works for a better part of... Since probably like August. Yeah, Not since August. Excellent. Well, we'll... Yeah, August was when we made the committee selection and September we had our first meeting. Tremendous. This is to answer the question or help us answer the question, what do we do with the old village hall? We have covered everything from A to Z. <laughs> I look forward to hearing your report. I know we all do, with great interest. Anything else? Other reports, anybody? 
All right, we'll move on to scheduled business. We have the omnibus vote items. Does any trustee wish to poll items one, two, or three? I'd like to take two. Trustee Kim would like to poll number two off. Anyone else? Okay, do I have a motion to pass items one and three on the omnibus vote list? So moved. Second. Motion by Kim, second by Trustee Meyer. Discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Kim? Yes. Meyer? Yes. Boss? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Motion carries. That takes us to tr item two, Trustee Kim. Um, I wasn't here for this meeting, so I wasn't sure how I, like, can I just say present oh, that I'm on. here? I mean, <laughs> that was 2009. I think we probably all, I don't know, was anyone? Yeah. Yeah, you were there. There you go. Trustee Kim and I were not here for that meeting. There you go. So Semple, Sullivan, and Voss were. I mean, well, but we don't have three who were here for that meeting tonight since Trustee Semple isn't here. Can we remove this and put it on the next meeting? Yes. Okay. So I'll need a motion to uh, remove this from the agenda. Okay. I'll make that motion. Motion by Kim to remove item two from the agenda. Second. Second by Sullivan. Discussion. Clerk, please call the roll. Kim. Yes. Sullivan. Yes. Voss. Yes. Meyer. Yes. Motion carries. That takes us to village staff reports. Village administrator, Mr. Lebedo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have one item uh, for consideration by the board. It's a resolution approving the final summary on the downtown redevelopment village hall construction project. Um, and uh, the summary of this, and I know Mr. Shupkego can answer more specific questions, but uh, this closes out uh, the village hall uh, project. Uh, there's remaining roughly $52,000 worth of additional work that has been enumerated on the punch list item in your uh, packet tonight. And uh, one of the uh, items that we take a lot of pride in is the fact that uh, we receive Lee Gold certification on uh, the building, and that was just announced a short time ago. Mm -hmm. And so that was always uh, a very, uh, always at the end of every conversation we had, where are we at with point systems? And it's based on point system. And so we're just thrilled that we were able to achieve that. Uh, it wasn't without a lot of uh, hard work uh, on the project. Uh, so if there's any questions specifically we can answer on this, we'd be glad to. Okay. Well, first our compliments on getting lead gold, mm -hmm. right? We've been talking about that since day one on this building, so that's excellent. You know, mm -hmm. congrats. I mean, that's that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, any, if there's no questions, then I guess we need a motion, then, right? Yes. So I need a motion from a trustee to adopt a resolution approving the final summary on downtown redevelopment village hall construction project. So moved. Motion by Trustee Meyer. Second by Trustee Sullivan. Further discussion. Okay, so please call the roll. Meyer? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Foss? Yes. Kim? Yes. Motion carries. I, I would just like to make one comment on this. And it's been said before, but maybe not as much publicly, but uh, Weston Solutions has been a great partner in uh, this building project. And, and uh, they had some, like any project, there's been some unknowns and unexpected things that happen. And, and I have to say that they have um, been true to their commitment to Mundline and to uh, getting this project done. They had some overruns, but they're not charging us uh, for those, and they're sticking to what the contract says and the guaranteed maximum price. And um, um, it's just been, uh, they've been, uh, it's refreshing, I guess, to work with a company that, um, you know, their word means something to them. And that's how they've been acting all along. So I just want to let the board know that. Okay. It's been a pleasure to deal with them. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Did that wrap up your yes. report? Okay. Very good. Let's go to um, Village Attorney, Mr. Marino. I have no report, and I don't believe there is any <coughs> session. 
Okay, thank you. Village clerk? Yes. Tomorrow is the last day to register or do a change of address for um, voting eligibility in the April 7th consolidated election, uh, the last day here in Village Hall. Um, once that closes to, um, tomorrow, the grace period begins uh, March 11th through April 4th at the Lake County Clerk's Office in Waukegan and March 23rd to April 4th at the Lake County Central Permit Facility on Winchester Road. That it? Okay. Okay, there's no executive session tonight. No other business. That wraps it up. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Second. Motion by Voss, second by Kim. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.